Houston, we have a problem. Genesis chapter 19, beginning at verse number 1, the Bible says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Hmm. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking you now in Jesus' holy name, you'll anoint me with the Holy Ghost and these with ears to hear and eyes to see as we present the truth about this problem that we have in our land. And I ask for this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You might remember that famous line from the Apollo 13 space mission. Some of you uh, perhaps even heard that presented over the radio. Houston, we've had a problem. An explosion occurred on the Apollo 13 flight. It was a third effort to send a, a uh, manned spacecraft to land on the moon. This one didn't make it. After the explosion, astronaut Lavelle reported to Houston, Houston, we've had a problem. Now, later they learned that not only did they lose two of the three fuel cells they needed for energy, they also discovered that that third and final oxygen tank was leaking. They certainly had a problem, all right. But you know, Houston has a bigger problem today, and it's a problem that's shared by all of us in the entire country. There's been an explosion of sorts, and uh, it's taken out America's spiritual fuel tanks, if you will. And the last one remaining is now leaking, and okay, okay, enough of the metaphor. It might seem a little bit enigmatic, but let's just state it clearly. America is slipping into the grip of the homosexual agenda. The sodomites have kind of encircled, if you will, the gate of this country. If you remember this morning's message, you can appreciate the implication. If you missed this morning's message, I'll give you a little insight on that in just a moment. But the homosexual community, uh, the sodomites, like the sodomites in Sodom, who gathered at the door of Lot's house, surrounding his house, pounding to get access to his family and to those men that were there, have, have really circled the gate, the gate of, the, of this country right now. Let me explain that. This morning I touched on it, and I'll develop a more full presentation on this later. You remember when Jacob uh, had the dream? He was leaving home to go and uh, join Laban and that story because of what he had done to Esau. Esau was angry, going to kill him. Mom said, you better leave. <laughs> so he took off. And in his journey, he took rest at a certain place. God sort of directed his steps to a certain special place. And he slept there that night, and in that night he had a dream, and he saw a ladder, Jacob's ladder. And on top of the ladder, he saw the glory of God could have used it in my presentation this evening. Another moment where one of God's men had a growth moment with a new, a new vision of who God is and what he's all about. But Jacob 
encountered God. And God said to him uh, that as he had given the promise to Abraham and passed it on to Isaac, now he was handing it to Jacob. Jacob was receiving the promise God had given Abraham. And in that encounter, when, when Jacob woke up, he said, wow, this is a dreadful place. This is a special spot. I mean, this is the place where God's house is. And so he named it Bethel. This is none other than God's house. And then he said this, the gate of heaven. The gate of heaven. Now, when you think of a gate, you probably automatically think of a, a place of entrance. So the gate of heaven would, in your mind, um, understandably, be the idea that you walk through this gate to get into heaven, the gate of heaven. But that would be the wrong idea. That's not what this means at all. Um, while gates certainly serve that purpose, that isn't the concept of the gate of heaven. You notice in our story, Lot sat in the gate of the city of Sodom. He sat in the gate. And that's a reference to somebody who takes his position as a judge in a city. It's the place of judgment is what it is. And Lot had an official place in the community of Sodom. And he had the honor of being the man who sat at the gate. And judgments, cases would be brought to him and he would render sentence and render judgment on these things. You'll see that elsewhere in the Bible, this use of the word gate. Absalom, for example, he went to the gate and there he, he uh, yeah, exchanged uh, with the traffic of those coming in and out and about. It was kind of a center, a kind of a hub of, of social and civil activity. <clears throat> and Absalom went there to try to win the hearts of the men from his father David. So that's what the gate is. That's what it refers to. Jesus is the door to heaven. Amen. Jesus is the door. And he's, only through Jesus can you get into heaven. <laughs> when we talk about the gate of heaven, we're not talking about that place where you get to go inside of heaven. We're talking about the place where God establishes his judgment. And where cases are brought, as it were, and where civil judgment is taken care of. I wish I had the time to show you the various places in scripture where that's supported. Hopefully, I've given you enough to be able to be with me in this thing. But this morning I touched on it. I'll develop it more in a message that's planned for later on. But Jesus talked about the gates of hell. And the same thing that's true of the gate of heaven is true of the gates of hell. It's the same idea. The authority of hell. The workings of hell. The activity of hell. The center, uh, the hub if you will, of, of the activity of hell. Uh, and its dominion is represented by that gate. And Satan has many of them. And the church today is the house of God. Jacob referred to the place where he was as the house of God, the gate of heaven. Well, today the church, of course, is the church. The church of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the church he started, the church he founded. The church to whom or to which he gave the keys of the kingdom. The church that he commissioned to go in the world and preach the gospel. The church is where the gate is now. All right? And we're as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, the church, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel, to call on all men everywhere to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Jesus himself preached in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye therefore and believe the gospel. That's what he preached. That's what we preach. And uh, that's the activity that goes on at the gate of heaven, and the church is the house of God, and we're that gate. Now, all of that is to say that the homosexuals are charging the gate. Like Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, the Lord's churches today are situate, as it were, in Sodom. And we are sitting at the gate. We must not do what Lot did. We must defend the gate. More on that in another time, but that's the situation we're in right now. And notice in the story how, how strange this is. You see, saw, uh, Lot actually lived right there around the gate. He lived there. That was his place of residence. 
And we live there as believers. We live at the gate, the gate of heaven, the house of the Lord. And the Sodomites have come to our gate. And, and now they're demanding that we turn our children over to them and turn uh, everything over to them. That's what's happening. And uh, so Lot so foolishly offered his children. And a lot of pastors today and a lot of churches today and a lot of politicians today are doing the same thing. Trying to placate the homosexual agenda. Trying to placate their demands. They are, they are saying... Well, don't do this. Here, we'll give you our children. And we're giving them access to our kids in the schools. We're giving them access to our children in the media. We're turning our children. We're doing exactly what Lot did. And I'm using we rhetorically. You're not doing that. I'm not doing that. But this country is doing that. We're turning our children over to the homosexual movement. Well, friend, that's got to stop. That's got to stop. Uh, somebody needs to stand up at the gate and say, whoa, 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 none of that. I also observe this. When God acted in a profound way to put a judgment upon the Sodomites, how did the Sodomites respond? They became even more aggressive. The angels smote them with blindness and rather than become afraid and go, oh, no, and back off and say, what have we done? Oh, God, help us. Oh, God, forgive us. And, and go look for mercy and scatter and go away. They remained focused and determined to their purpose. And they kept pursuing even with more anger and, and determination to get what they wanted. And they were groping blind trying to find the door, trying to get in. It's unbelievable. And back in the early 70s when, when God, and according to Romans chapter 1, this is exactly what happened. You see, the Bible says concerning that community and that lifestyle and that behavior, that they receive in their body the due recompense of their reward. That's what the Bible says. And my, how they bristle when a preacher says, look, this AIDS thing that came upon the homosexual community came upon them because of their sinful behavior. When that happened, I don't know if you know this or not, but when the gate, when the, uh, we call it now HIV AIDS, when that first broke out, it was exclusive in the homosexual community. Nobody else was getting it. In fact, the name they gave it was GRID or GRIDS. It was gay related immune, uh, Im immune, Im <laughs> immunodeficiency syndrome. Gay-related immune deficiency grid. That's what they named it because that's what it was. How did the homosexual community respond when it became public that they were having this problem? And by the way, that's not the only disease that particular lifestyle brings upon their body. There's a whole list. I've gone over it in my radio show a few times. There's a whole list of various diseases that are not necessarily exclusive to that community, and AIDS really not, is not even exclusive to them anymore, which is sad. But we'll get into that in a moment. But exacerbated and, and predominant. I mean, they've got a far greater representation of certain kinds of cancer in that community. It's way overrepresented in, in the population of, of the gay community people. I, I, I don't want to go into that because it takes so much time to go into it, but just understand there are a lot of diseases that are associated with that behavior. It's a wicked and vile thing. It's just exactly what God said, that they receive in their body the due recompense of their reward. But how do they respond? How did they respond when it came out that they were having an, uh, a, just a, a, an epidemic of, of grid cases in the gay community? You know what they did? They got more, that's when they launched their, their attack to make homosexuality acceptable in the community, in the mainstream. Many of you don't know that. That's when all of this started. That's when the homosexual community began to organize 
and to begin to strategize how they could get their lifestyle normalized in the general community. And one of the reasons that they had for wanting to do that was because they knew that if they became mainstream, then they would get the support of the overall community to find a cure for the disease. And they were afraid if they didn't have general acceptance, they would not have the sympathy of the American people, and there would not be any research done, and they would be just left to die. Now, whether they're right or they're wrong about that is no longer relevant. What's happened is, though they were smitten with this horrific disease, Rather than repent, they became even more bold. And in their spiritual blindness, they're groping at the door, trying to get to the gate. They want to get the church. Why do they want to insist that pastors perform their weddings? Why? Why do they want to insist that churches open their doors for the performance of their weddings? Why don't they just go do it somewhere else? No, they've got to have the gate. They've got to get the church. Because they are children of disobedience. And they are under the influence of the prince and the power of the air. And he knows where his threat is. And he has a determination to compromise the church with this wickedness. So that the church finally loses any influence it could possibly ever hope to have in this country or anywhere else in the world. You know how we're dealing with this Ebola crisis right now? It's just an amazing thing. It, it's mind-boggling how the administration will say things like, uh, through their spokesperson there, the chief of the CDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, Tom Friedman, I think his name <coughs> is his name, <coughs> would say something so asinine as, well, we can't close the borders because that would actually uh, cause this problem to be exacerbated. It would increase the risk of Americans to get the disease if we close the borders. How stupid is that? At the same time, however, they are closing the borders for our American citizens who have been in those countries. Before they can come back, they have to endure 21 days of, uh, of quarantine. Now, regular passengers from Liberia or Sierra Leone or Guinea, which is where we have the outbreak of this disease, <clears throat> they can come over here without being quarantined. But if you're an American citizen who goes over there, you have to be quarantined before you can come back over here. He even signed an order to allow the generals to quarantine our own soldiers who have been sent over there by this country to help them, but they can't come back home unless first they satisfy 21 days of quarantine. Well, why won't they make that the rule for everybody coming from or through those countries? And besides that, I thought we were told that doesn't work. There's another agenda at foot here. There's something else going on. They politicize that disease. They politicize it so that it's not in the interest of Obama and company to to close the borders because that will raise the hue and cry against him in a lot of other areas. It'll cost him some political capital with certain people and politically motivated then, he's avoiding doing what really needs to be done for the health and safety of the general population. This is not the first time that happened. The same thing happened with AIDS. In fact, HIV AIDS was the first time in history that I can find where a disease became a political issue. Some of my listeners were not around when that dreaded disease creeped out of the closets of the homosexuals and into our faces. But the homosexual community responded by bullying the medical profession, literally bullying them. Gathering at meetings of the American Psychiatric, Psychiatric, Psychiatric Association, I'm sorry, <laughs> those guys, uh, and coming into their meetings and screaming at them and, and threatening them and holding signs and protesting and yelling at them and, and bullying them, intimidating them and screaming at them and telling them and trying to pressure them to take homosexuality off the list of mental diseases. All the way up until then, homosexuality was listed among mental disorders and was treated like a mental disease. 
But in response to all this, homos- the AIDS thing that came out, the homosexual strategize, they've got to make themselves mainstream. And one thing they knew they needed to do is to get the American psychiatric, psychi- I can't say that word for some reason tonight, the, the, the psychiatrist people, to get them to take homosexuality off of the list of mental illnesses. They succeeded. The APA backed off. There, I'll just say it that way. Backed off and removed homosexuality from the list of mental illnesses. They also bullied certain politicians. Now listen to this. And for a while, I don't know if you remember this. I remember it because I was very much engaged in it. I was speaking at various council meetings and I was, I was really into this thing back then. For a while, they were able to interfere with efforts to require blood donors to reveal whether or not they were homosexuals. Now, if you donate blood, as, as I do, they'll ask you a whole bunch of questions, and among them are questions like, have you had, you know, relations with another, with men, on men type, they'll ask you that question. Kind of uncomfortable. But I'm always glad to say, nah, <laughs> ain't happening here, you know. But now they ask that question, but I'm telling you something, at first, the gay lobby was furious about that and did not want that to be a requirement for donating blood. And I just talked to a, a fellow whose parents or grandparents, his dad, his grandfather, actually got AIDS because of that. He got, he got it through a blood transfusion. They even prevented for a while politicians from requiring testing of all blood to ensure it was HIV free. Did you know that? Some of you didn't know that. The homosexuals reacted to this outbreak of GRID by redoubling their efforts to protect themselves and then they even began to strategize how they were going to get to our kids, get to our schools. They came up with this a homosexual scientist came up with this gay gene and all that junk went on and it was all nothing but a pack of lies. The whole thing was a nightmare. Fortunately, a lot of that got rectified over time. They do now require the screening for blood donors and they do test the blood to make sure it's HIV protected. Thank God. Who here would want to get a blood transfusion supposing that, who knows, some homosexual might have donated his blood? This idea of having policies shaped, political policies shaped by sensitivity to the carriers of a disease rather than by concern for the safety of the general population started with the HIV outbreak in the homosexual community. You know, I've said it many times, embracing homosexuality in our culture will corrupt core values to such an extent that it will make us socially insane. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 1 very quickly. Let's look at this passage. Romans chapter 1. You're familiar with it. Let's go ahead and pick it up at verse number... 27, oh, let's pick it up at verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. What I want you to see in that passage is the development here, and we normally would have begun at verse 18, or begun at verse 18 and worked all the way through, and you can see a progression of degeneration. The end of the, of the degeneration of a society, right at the threshold of the end of it, is when a society embraces homosexuality, and then it just falls apart. All moral restraint just goes away. And a society becomes flooded with all this junk. That's where we are. Houston, we've got a problem. Big time. Homosexuality is insanity. It's a mental disorder. However, it's rooted in deep-seated rebellion against God. That's where it comes from. And their mind is reprobated from God. What does that mean? A reprobate mind is a mind that is abandoned to punishment. It's been let go and set loose. I mentioned in the earlier part, if God, if it were not for God's prevenient grace, it's called, where God intervenes and restrains us from being all that we are or doing all that we are. If it were not for that ministration of God's grace, we would be Genesis chapter 6 all over again. Because we are really messed up in our nature. What's happened to these people is God has given them over to their nature. They've been reprobated. God has let them go. And so their mind is alienated from God. And they've been surrendered to the control of their vices. They are in the grip of their vice. Clever play with words, but a serious truth. They're in the grip of their vice. They are turned over to the control of their moral impurities. This is what it means to be reprobated. This puts these people at odds with nature as God designed it. Homosexuality is unnatural. It is insane. It's as insane as a man thinking that he's a woman. That's pretty insane. Today, that's being... Accepted. So I have to reach a little farther to get an illustration that'll serve my purpose. Some years ago, I could say that, that'd be enough. And people would go, yeah, that's really insane. But now today, Governor Brown would sign a bill that allows children to decide what gender they are. And this dust up in Texas is over a bill that supposedly protects transgenders so they can use whatever restroom they want to and so on. So I'll have to reach a little farther and say it's as insane as a man who thinks he's a cow, which is equally insane as a man who thinks he's a woman. Or a man who thinks he's a dog, it's insane. It's as insane as a man or a woman thinking they can marry their dog or their horse. It's insane. It's contrary to nature. They've been let go. Their mind has been cut loose of prevenient grace. They've been set loose from any moral restraint. And all morality will collapse in a culture that embraces that. There is no way for a culture to twist their mind into a shape and their heart into a shape that's able to embrace homosexuality as a norm without setting in motion a distortion that reaches to the soul and mind that will bring all moral restraint to a point of collapse in this culture, social morals will degenerate into darker and darker, darker things, and diseases will rise and become stronger and stronger, overtaking our culture, our society, and reaching to our children. America must repent of this abandonment of God and His Bible and return to the old paths where is the good way. I'm sure you've heard about that. Texas dust up where lesbian Houston Mayor Anise Parker has led the city of Houston to subpoena quote the sermons and other pastoral communications end quote of a list of pastors that she's targeted with a threat that if they fail to comply they will be held in contempt of court. Let me give a little background on that and bring you a little update on that. Houston city legislators passed a non-discrimination ordinance last June 
Not something they put to the vote of the people, they just passed it in legislation. 50,000 citizens in Houston signed a petition requiring the city to put this on the ballot as a referendum, allowing the good citizens of Houston a chance to speak their opinion about this. 50,000 signatures far exceeds the 17,269, and where they got the number, I'm not sure, some kind of percentage of the population, I think. But they needed 17,269 signers on this petition to qualify it for the ballot. They got 50,000. They got more than they needed. So what did the council do? Well, the council in Houston did exactly what's been done to us here in California over and over again. They spat in the faces of the voters and trampled on the rule of law and asserted their dictatorial intent to bully the people into submission to their determination to force their immorality down the throats of their community. That's what's happening in California. Over and over again. When we speak and we say we don't want this, they just go ahead and do it anyway. Well, what did they do then? Well, they decided they would dismiss the signatures for alleged irregularities. This bill is called the bathroom bill in Houston, Texas. The ordinance is one of those ridiculous transgender promoting laws that requires your wife, for example, to share a restroom with some confused, insane man who thinks he's a woman. Or who desires perhaps to identify as and with women. Or perhaps he just has a strange, perverse desire to get into the ladies' restrooms. God help us. This is sick, folks. I mean, it's disgusting, it's perverted, it's sick. And our forefathers would literally be reaching for the barf bag if they knew what we were doing with the liberties they gave us. When I say it's sick, I mean to take full advantage of, a, of the triple entendre here in, in, the, in the language. It's spiritually sick. It's physically sickening. It's medically advancing a behavior that is deathly sickening. When opponents of the bathroom bill filed a lawsuit against the mayor of the city, the secretary and the city of Houston, over the illegal dismissal of the referendum. The city responded by issuing subpoenas of a select group of pastors. And what's interesting in this case is it's just, no, it's just another evidence, just no sense of law and order. It's exactly what we're reading here. These people, when they get to that place in their mind, when a culture gets to the point of distortion in their moral values and so on, where they can accept this, they can, have, they can set their mind to accept something so unnatural and everything. When people get to that place, I mean, the rule of law is out. There's no sanity anywhere. If you're that insane, you have no sanity anywhere. She's subpoenaing pastors who weren't even part of that lawsuit. She picked ones on purpose who were part of a group of 400 pastors who made a coalition together to oppose this bill. And she singled out pastors from that particular group, targeted them. Unbelievable. How could any court not just say, what are you doing? And kick it out. This is flagrant. It's out of your mind, insane, flagrant disregard for the whole concept of the rule of law and for the fundamental law of our First Amendment, of our constitutional protections. Now, I need to remind you of the number of times that I have said homosexuals are bullies who are intent on forcing their immorality on every community that will give them place. Embracing homosexuality, the homosexual agenda, will necessarily lead to a loss of liberty. It's impossible to grant special rights for homosexuals without, axiomatically, just naturally. I mean, if you grant special rights to homosexuals, you have canceled rights of others. And here you have the First Amendment under assault in the name of protecting homosexual rights to, to what? Not be talked about? Well, they have a right for a preacher not to call what they do a sin? Well, why don't the adulterers get together and say, hey, these preachers can't say what I'm doing is a sin? Why don't all the liars get together and say, hey, preachers can't preach against lying? Huh? Think about it. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's insane. It's insane. That's my point. The whole thing is insane. The whole nation is going insane following this whole homosexual agenda. 
Good night. We tell adulterers their behavior is sinful all the time. Why should homosexuals have a special right that adulterers don't have? Or that fornicators don't have? Or that liars and cheats and thieves don't have? Granting special rights and privileges to any group, by the way, necessarily abrogates the rights of others outside that group. That's just the way it's always going to be. It's wrong to do that. In particular, yielding to the homosexual agenda will necessitate abrogating virtually all of our fundamental rights. I've touched on it in various shows, how one fundamental right after another is being broken down under the weight of the homosexual demand that we accept them and that behavior as normal. The more homosexuals agenda, the more of the homosexual agenda you accept, the more of your rights you will see that you lose. I guarantee you, you will lose your liberties in direct proportion to how much ground you yield to the perverse homosexual agenda. So anyway, a lawsuit has been filed to gain an injunction against the city and to quash these subpoenas and to end this witch hunt. To bring it up to current, what's happened is the Attorney General of Texas has stepped in and asked Parker to back off the subpoenas. She did. But now, further update, I learned she's reasserted the subpoenas, changed the language. She's not asking for their sermons now because that's protected free speech. She's asking for their speeches. It's insane. These people are insane. Everybody following them are insane. The entire thing is insanity. The country is losing its mind. Giving in to this insane behavior, which is contrary to nature, and to nature's God, an abomination to Almighty God. Amen. Amen. It's cursed. Remember the story of Sodom. We looked at it earlier at the beginning of the message. The Sodomites surrounded the house of Lot, demanded he send out the men of his house so they could know them. And even though blinded by the angels for their wickedness, they continued to grope at the door of Lot's house, demanding he turn his guests over to them. They are Insane. It's interesting that in the very beginning of their effort to normalize this behavior, they targeted the psychiatric, uh, that crowd. Why can I not say that word tonight? I don't know why. Psychiatric community. They targeted that crowd first. That was their first onslaught to get them to remove homosexuality from the list of mental disorders. We need to reassert that because it is insanity. Most sodomites think they have a right to force their vile lifestyle on everyone else. They will not rest content until they have brought us all under their immorality, their immoral viewpoint. Because the morality base of the homosexual lifestyle and the morality base of normal people, natural people, who aren't insane and perverted and twisted backwards. They can't live side by side that way. One or the other will prevail. There's no getting along with the homosexual and just leaving them alone. And the reason isn't because we won't leave them alone, it's because they will not leave us alone. It wasn't enough for us to say, well, you know, to each his own, whatever you want to do. No, now they got to they got to take marriage and make that mean something that it's never meant in millennia. That's not enough either. they got to go into our schools and teach our kids their lifestyle. That's not enough either. They, gotta, they never have enough because they're driven by an insane, insatiable desire to corrupt and pervert those around them. The sodomites came to Lot's house and wanted to pervert those men and would not let go till they could, did it, till they could do that. And that's the way these people are. You see, folks, some things are just part of nature as God designed it. And you cannot alter it without creating great damage. And you need to understand that there is a point of intersection between the spiritual and the physical. Where if you corrupt the spiritual, it brings God's judgment into the physical. Do you understand that principle? There's a relationship between the spiritual and the physical. So that if you order your life correctly under God, it does bring into the physical His blessing. 
If you defy God in the spiritual, it brings his judgment into the physical. One simple example and illustration, that's true by the way, generally. But one simple way to see it is in this area of God's rules governing what we will call euphemistically and for the sake of the children who are with us, I want to be delicate, but we would call the marriage act or the marriage gift, okay? If you pervert that, see the marriage bed is undefiled. If you pervert that, it brings disease. It brings death. It brings destruction into the physical world. It's a spiritual law. If it's violated, it brings all kinds of problems into the physical realm, doesn't it? You've got to understand that. And what that means is, with regard to the whole political game they're playing right now among the so-called conservative GOP who are beginning to say, well, you know, this homosexual issue really isn't something that bothers. That's just for... No. If we give into that in the spiritual, damage and destruction and disease and, and all kinds of judgment will come into the physical. We've got to stop it at the gate. We cannot let them have our churches. The Houston pastors must resist this. They must not give their children to the sodomites. They must not give their freedoms to the sodomites. They must not give their sermons to the sodomites. Except in this way. I would like to send this one to Ms. Parker. Let's conclude. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Look at verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And it goes on to say, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I think we need that verse. I think Lighthouse Baptist Church needs that verse. I think Pastor Scheidbach needs that verse. Be not weary in well-doing, for we, if, if we faint not, we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. Hang in there, church. Amen. Hang in there. We will reap one day. But what you're going to reap depends on what you've sown. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. That's just exactly what I'm saying. If you sow to the Spirit, you reap, you reap life everlasting. You reap spiritual blessing. If you defy God in the spiritual, the divine judgments of God come into the physical. Don't let the devil trick you in any way at all. That's the way it is. And that's what will happen in this country if we don't stop them at the gate. They've come to the gate. The church of God, the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth, the gate of heaven, if you will. They come to the gate. They're pounding on the gate doors. They're charging. They are charging the gates, the gate of heaven instead of the church charging the gates of hell. Sad, isn't it? We brought this on ourselves. We've given them place for so long. They've gathered, they've gathered such strength that now they're openly, and even though it's irreconcilable to a reasonable mind to even understand how anybody could think the way she's thinking. Well, well, we won't take their sermons, but we'll take their speeches. What does she think a sermon is? Well, it's just a matter of games with them and language with them and words with them. They're just playing games. She wants to get the gate. And they won't let up until they do. Which is why we must stop them at the gate. 